So I don't think it will be possible to identify the secret of ending poverty just by comparing the historical experience of 100 or 200 countries. It's a very different statement from uh, whether something can be learned from those regression. But I think the secret of eradicating poverty is not going to come uh, is not going to come out of this, out of those uh, regressions. So does that mean that, so does that mean that we should give up this issue? This is just too big a problem and we should focus on things that we can handle, other things. This is a little bit sometimes Billy Sterling's uh, prescription when he says, well, experts have nothing to say on poverty, we should let this problem to the countries themselves. They can figure it out, and in particular to the people of these countries. Again, leave these seven billion experts sort this out. So I don't, I don't think so. I think we just kind of have forgotten in this debate of, in the, by setting for ourselves this goal of eradicating poverty, or as scientists, of saying something about the eradication of poverty, we have forgotten along the way what is the problems we were trying to solve. The problem we were trying to solve is we have 1.4 billion people who today live under a dollar a day. What can be done in order to make them live a better life? So if we could, of course, make sure that all of them now have $10 a day, that would be great. We would have solved the problem. But if we cannot do that, it doesn't mean that we don't have other ways to approach the problem. And Amartya Sen, I think, has made a very important, it's very simple, but very important contribution by helping us define poverty in a broader sense than lack of income. Poverty is not only lack of income, it's also the lack of the possibility to realize your full potential, if you want. The lack of education, the lack of health, the lack of decision power over your own life are all of the things that define, in a sense, poverty. Now, if we define poverty this way, and if our objective is not only to make people who live under one dollar to make them live under two dollars, if we define poverty in this way, then we have a little bit, we have maybe a path to say, well, can we do something about all of these aspects of being poor? Can we do something, if we cannot make everybody rich, or at least we don't know how to do it, some countries have managed to do it, but we don't know how, so we cannot really replicate that very easily. Can we at least make sure that in the meantime, here and now, we can help, can we contribute as science anything to the policy discourse uh, or to the policy, uh, um, to the policy work against poverty? <coughs> and I think that we can, in the sense, I think that social science, but, and in particular economics, not only economics, but of course, I'm speaking here as an economist, Social science has something to say about this question, and in particular, it can play a role guiding policy in the process of creative experimentation. So first, let me start with Roosevelt. Uh, this is a, a quote that I owe to Danny Roderick. He put it on his blog to, uh, as something which, is going, which should help us in thinking on in current crisis. It's a quote from Roosevelt from that crisis, and I think it's a beautiful uh, quote. The country needs, and unless I mistake its temper, the country demands bold, persistent experimentation. It is common sense to take a method and try it. If it fails, admit it frankly and try another, but above all, try something. Ah. The fight against poverty, in a sense, is a response to a permanent state of crisis. I think this quote, I agree, completely agree with Danny that this quote apply, applies to today. Uh, to, the, to the rich countries today, but I think more generally it also applies to this idea of, of poverty. And social policy in rich countries and in poor countries, not only for, for poor countries, uh, needs and often lacks imagination. It's not only researchers who are uh, prisoners of this uh, temptation to l go for the big, big goal and forget the small goals along the way. In fact, I think it's a frequent political pitfall to announce a grand objective and then to, to be forced to prove that you have reached this objective or at least that you are on the way towards reaching this objective. And in fact, we, there is a need of experimentation in the sense there is a need of trying things. And trying things 
in, a, in accepting to fail, as Roosevelt was saying. So I think economics and economists can guide policy in a process of creative experimentation, which has two aspects. One is experimenting in the sense of trying new things, think out of the box. The second thing is, once you try new things, accept the possibility of failure and give your chance the chance to give yourself the chance to realize that you've made a mistake. Uh, you know, if it fails, admit it frankly and try another. So experimenting, not only in the sense, in the common sense of the world of trying something out, but experimenting in a scientific sense, in the sense of doing the experiment scientifically in order to learn something out of it. And this is the way I think about evaluation. I don't think about evaluation so much as some retrospective exercise to figure out what happened. I more think about evaluation in a prospective sense as a way to help us plan how to move forward from there. So economists can play a role, in my view, in these two dimensions of experimentation. First, in the design of programs in their sphere of expertise. Second, in the evaluation of programs. And that, it turns out, we have uh, an expertise in evaluation, which, is, for accidental reasons, I guess, is a little bit broader than for just economics program, to guide uh, just scientific evaluation. So now, if you, if you will allow me, I'll discuss both uh, I'll discuss both points in turn. First, whether economists have something to say about designing social policy, in particular on type, uh, on, uh, on type poverty policy. So there is a, so I, I, I firmly believe that uh, economists can say something normative about the world. Uh, I realize that I'm not, that not everybody thinks like that. There is a strong positive transition in economics, which is mainly emerges with the with the Chicago School. Uh, you might know, you might all know the the, the famous image of the economist as a billiard play, player. So the agent, the economic agent, is like a billiard player, and the economist is like a physicist uh, watching uh, the billiard player play billiard. So a physicist can look at can try to infer the law of physics from looking at the way the billiard players send the ball and how they move and eventually end up in the, in the holes. But if the physicists try to replace the billiard speaker or a billiard player or give them advice, that would probably be a disaster from the point of view of billiard anyway. So likewise, the economic agents, even if they cannot solve the problem that the economist tried for them, is perfectly able to solve them has already done them to the best of its ability, and that's it, and that's the end of it. So I think this is a, this is a very, this was a, it is, still is a very useful way of thinking, in particular for development economics. I think it was a founding moment of development economics as a real discipline with Ted Schultz in the 1960s, when he sort of took us away from thinking of the people in developing world as kind of not particularly smart or whatever, and said no, not at all. People in developing countries are just like you and me, except they're poor. And he looked in particular at data that Soltex had, had, an, had analyzed from Guatemala and developed this, coined this phrase, a poor but efficient. They, are, they don't have very much endowment. So with this poor endowment, they are doing what they can, which is not great, but that's the best possible. And they are, as much as he could say, they are optimizing within their, within their means. So uh, Abhijit Banerjee, in a 2002 article, has an interesting uh, uh, discussion of this positive versus normative debate. And he suggests that maybe we, uh, we are a little bit too ambitious for the description of the economist as a, sci as a pure scientific, like a physicist, and maybe a little bit too ambitious for the description of the agent as a billiard player. He's saying that economics decision is more like a craft. It doesn't maybe require that much precision that the ball has to go exactly there. But it really can benefit from expertise and experience. And um, then we can think of the economist as, a, as an experienced craftsman, so maybe like an engineer rather than a scientist, or even if you want, like a very good plumber, who on the issue of plumbing, or economics plumbing for what we are concerned, may have something to say that can be of some use. 